For context, I have been a junior firefighter for a little over a year now, and I've been working at a very old and arguably haunted firehouse. Junior firefighters can go on calls, however we obviously are not interior firefighters, and we provide exterior support and scavenge for anything that survived the fire when it's been put out. My first call happened three months into my career. I was excited and nervous. I rode with the chaplain, another junior, and three interior firefighters, not including those in the front seats, one of whom I didn't recognize. I thought this was because they were still people I hadn't met, and that was true. I still only knew a handful of people at the station. So I sat in the extra seat you have to pull down. Also, on the truck and engine, we put on a sound-canceling headsets to drown out loud siren and help us communicate. They're a bit weird and you have to hold the microphone less than half an inch to your mouth to talk and be heard. On the way there, the other junior said something that I couldn't hear, so I just assumed he said something about this being my first call or something. We arrived at the scene and the first thing that I noticed after the fire was the crowd. So me and the other junior provided crowd control while the engine showed up with exterior firefighters. I honestly don't remember much from this. The prior excitement had boiled into fear and anxiety. The three interior firefighters went in and, truth be told, the fire wasn't all that bad in hindsight. However, I would see much worse fires. Anyway, I'm not sure how much time had passed, but before I knew it, the fire was still burning the house and two of the interior firefighters were back outside as their air cylinder had run out. Then I remembered the third guy and I asked the other junior how long the guy sitting across from me on the truck had been at the station as he seemed to have great composure and could maintain calm breathing in a fire. I had only seen him in turnout gear so I didn't know his body type. The other junior looked at me and said, We only had two interior firefighters on the call with us and I told you on the way there that you didn't need to sit in the spare seat. Confused, I approached the chaplain and asked him if we had three interiors on the truck with us, and he also said no. When the fire was put out, we went inside and did our thing. I found no trace of another firefighter. When we got back to the station, I asked the chief about the man. I gave a good description, I think, and the chief gave a confused but interested stare. He brought me to the off-duty room upstairs and showed me a picture on the wall and pointed to a firefighter in his turnout gear along with a much younger chief and asked me if that was the man I saw. It was, and I told him this. He told me his name and that he passed away from lung cancer in 2002. A lot of firefighters die this way sadly and I doubt he was the only one to die this way at our station. I believe he was watching over me on my first call as I'm sure he did with the other junior. I'm a 22-year-old female, and the following events occurred when I was between 19 and 21. When I moved away for college, I started talking to the Catholic priest, Father Gabe, who ran the chapel and woman's shelter behind my dorm building because something scary happened to me, and I didn't know who else to talk to. Plus, he was literally a hundred feet from my bedroom window. Anyway, long story short, Father Gabe is the exorcist for vast surrounding areas and he's also a demonologist who was born in and studied in Rome. He's super old, like 87, and he's super broad-minded for a priest. I feel the need to specify that I'm not an overly religious person. I'm more spiritual and my basic belief system is that there is something greater than us that our minds just simply aren't able to comprehend and that this is the entity we label as God. But there are also other things out there as well. Things that are beyond us and are sometimes malevolent. Demon isn't really the right term, but it's the only way to give a modern comparison. Basically, I think that every religion in the world has a piece of the puzzle, but none of them have the whole picture. Last, it's important I explain the reason why I began working with Father Gabe on his cases. For the sake of space, I'm going to be very candid. I have a sixth sense and my connection to the other side has been very strong ever since I was a small child. It runs in my family on both sides, so I guess you could say I was like a psychic genetic jackpot, for better or for worse. I told Father Gabe about this and after testing me numerous times, he asked me for my help with an extremely volatile case. I agreed with much hesitation, and that's where the story begins. The victim was a young boy, maybe seven years old. I'll be using pseudonyms for the family members to protect their privacy, so let's call him Danny. Now, 
Danny has been acting very strange for the past few months, and its parents have taken him to numerous doctors, psychologists, specialists, etc., but they were never able to diagnose him with anything. His mom, Sarah, was a nurse and the family wasn't particularly religious, but Sarah's parents convinced her to take Danny to the Baptist church they attended to see the pastor, and the pastor knew that there was something horribly wrong with this kid, but that he didn't have the necessary skills or knowledge to help. That's when Father Gabe was called. Now, the memories are kind of fuzzy, it's been a few years, so I can't really remember Danny's whole story like when the weirdness started and how things escalated to the point that they did, but I do remember listening to a recording of Father Gabe's first interview with this kid, and there were multiple voices talking with some speaking different languages. Just unnatural stuff. But anyway, I'll keep the investigation portion of the story because although a lot of crazy stuff happened then, it wasn't anything like the actual exorcisms. And yes, that's plural. It took eight sessions over the course of roughly six weeks. I'm just going to detail the most intense and terrifying parts and gloss over everything else because of space. So, first exorcism attempt. Danny is strapped down to the bed with hospital restraints and hooked up to an IV because he stopped eating and drinking. Sarah, being a nurse, was able to get these things fairly easy, so I went in there thinking, oh cool, we won't have to hold him down like in those crazy exorcism movies. But I was so very wrong. Real quick, the way a Catholic exorcism goes is sort of like mass. Basically, there's the part that the priest says, then there's the part that the congregation says. It's mostly just echoing whatever the priest says, and Father Gabe performed his in Latin, but it can be done in English. So, Father Gabe starts reading from his Roman Rites book, and the other younger assisting priest, Randall, as well as myself, were all reading along too. Not even a page in, and this kid starts struggling violently against his restraints, and when he realizes that his wrists and ankles are strapped down, this kid bends his spine forward in the most unnatural arch so far that his face was almost against his stomach and he bites the IV connected to his right arm and rips the needle out with his teeth. I kid you not, blood splattered everywhere and was spraying from the hole in his vein like a horror movie. I had to drop my book and help Father Randall, Roy, Danny's dad, and Harold, Sarah's dad and Danny's grandpa, hold Danny down while his mom bandaged him up. Skip ahead to the fourth attempt. We're all worn out. Danny obviously the most, but we know we have to power through. So, we start the exorcism, and things start getting crazy. The power goes out, and one by one the candles in the room are blown out. Now, I'm afraid of the dark, so the moment the power cuts out, I'm already kneeling on the ground digging through my bag for one of my flashlights. I find it quickly, but by then the room is pitch black and strangely silent. My hands are shaking as I fumble around trying to turn on the flashlight when I suddenly smell rancid meat and a deep guttural voice asks me in a mocking tone, Are you afraid now? Directly into my ear from just over my shoulder. I immediately leap up and let out a hysterical shriek of fear, dropping the flashlight to the ground in the process. When it hits the ground, it turns on and the beam of light darts around the room as it bounces briefly, illuminating Danny, standing in the center of his bed, staring right at me with the most disturbing smile I've ever seen, his eyes completely black. I hear the rest of my party release startled and unnerved squeaks and screams, and I fall down to my knees instantly and start blindly feeling around for the flashlight that I can no longer see since it went off just as soon as it had clicked on. I find it soon and flick it on to see that Danny is no longer standing on the bed like he was less than a second ago. I shine the light around, and much to everyone's shock and horror, we find him crammed into the foot and a half wide gap between the top of his bookshelf and the ceiling. His body is contorted and he's crying, confused as to why he's up there, and it looks like a lot of pain from that position. All the men help him down, and just like that the power comes back on. Skip ahead again to the seventh attempt. I'm not even sure if this kid is going to survive this and that alone is enough to keep me rattled emotionally. We're halfway through the exorcism and I see the main entity that's been inhabiting Danny's body suddenly appear. It's squatting on top of Danny's chest, staring down at him, laughing. Its skin is inky black, so black that it absorbs all the light that hits it instead of reflecting it. Everything about its body is long and thin, 
The fingers are long as well, coming to sharp points on the end. Not like claws, just like only continuous pointed digits. It looked almost like a skeleton wearing skin, only it was much thinner, and its mouth was full of razor sharp teeth. And as for its eyes, there are no words in any language on the earth to describe their true malice and horror. All I can say is I never knew that the color white could be just as dark as the color black. Anyway, already being emotional, I lose it and start yelling at this thing to get off of Danny and to leave him alone. Everyone probably thinks I look insane since I'm the only one who can see this thing, but I keep demanding that it leave. It then looks at me, but I'm so angry that I fight back the urge to cower in fear. It smiles and says in that guttural voice again, don't get so angry. It's all just a game. And then this thing sinks into Danny's chest, like he just absorbed the entity. I'm still working on processing what had just happened when I hear a loud metallic snap. It doesn't take us long to realize that the sound was Danny's right-handed restraint buckle because he suddenly sits up and slowly turns his head until he's staring at me. Once again, his eyes are completely black and his face is stretched into the most horrific smile. There's a tense moment of silence before Danny opens his mouth and in his own voice asks, Do you want to play a game? Before I can even answer, both the power and the candles are extinguished and I feel a gust of wind blow past me and listen as the other members of my party are slammed into the walls and shelves behind us. I'm freaking out by now and reach for my tiny flashlight that I'd clipped in my belt loop to avoid being caught without one when I realize that it was no longer there. My mind goes into absolute panic mode as I hear the sound of a metal cap unscrewing and two thunks on the hardwood floor next to Danny's bed. Flashlights are against the rules, I hear Danny say with a giggle. I'm obviously borderline crapping my pants as I squeak out for Father Gabe. What do we do? All I hear is a groan of pain from him and Danny angrily shouts, They aren't allowed to play. I'm almost crying now as I ask, What do you want? Another giggle. To play. Then, on come the lights. I'm nearly blinded by the sudden exposure but when my eyes adjust, I can hardly believe what I'm seeing. All the males in our group are pinned up against the wall, obviously unable to move. Sarah and I are staring at each other with the same scared expression and suddenly I hear a low growl come out of Danny, bringing our attention back to him. He isn't smiling anymore, instead he looks downright livid. I thought I said lights were against the rules. He snarls, his voice reverting back to the deep guttural one. From across the house, I hear Danny's grandpa, Leroy, yell that he flipped the circuit breaker back on, and Danny flies into a rage. He starts thrashing wildly while yelling, You broke the rules! Over and over, Sarah and I move forward to pin him down and restrain him once again when he suddenly stops flailing. There's a toxic pause before I hear him whisper in a barely audible voice, Now, I'm going to break something. And then, his body starts contorting in the most unnatural way I'd seen since the beginning of this whole ordeal. He twisted and twisted, putting massive amounts of stress on his left shoulder as if he were trying to pry himself out of his other restraint. It clicked then what he was trying to do, and Sarah and I jumped on him and tried to hold him down. I'm not ashamed to say that by this point I started crying. Sarah and I struggled to stop his body from winding any further, but to no avail. I'm 5'7 and 130 pounds, I'm by no means a pushover and Sarah was only a little smaller than me, but we may as well have been trying to push down a marble statue. We're both crying at this point and then, the one thing about all of this that I will never forget for the rest of my life, Danny's left shoulder caves in, wrenching downward in the socket with a sickening and unmistakable pop. And just like that, he was back. That thing left him to feel the pain of the shoulder it had just dislocated. I've never heard another human being scream like that, and I doubt I ever will again. So, this is where I'll stop. I have many, many more stories, but I just wanted to broad stroke the most terrifying and traumatizing of the events that took place. 
I'm not asking anyone to believe me, but I thought that others might find the story interesting. The world is full of darkness and light, and this experience has given me a glimpse of both. This occurred in 2008. My daughter was four at the time and was playing with her toys, and I remember specifically watching Sports Center on ESPN and my older brother next to me reading a newspaper. Suddenly my daughter came over to me and out of the blue says, Daddy, I just want to let you know that your grandpa is okay and that he's returned to Texas. He wanted to let you know. And sat down and continued to play with her toys. I froze in shock. For one, my grandfather has passed away over a year and a half before my daughter was born. He was born in Texas in 1920 and moved to Ohio in 1939. He married my grandmother a year later and lived the rest of his life here. I never really mentioned my grandfather to my daughter, much less told her specifically where he was born. Me and my brother looked bewildered. When I asked her how did she know this, she just said, Because he told me. Nothing like this has happened after, but it still gives me chills to this day, but also some comfort as it seemed that he was okay. But how can my four-year-old specifically know where he was from when I have never once talked to her about it? And if he did come to her, what could him returning to Texas mean? I feel psycho for even having to try to explain this experience that happened to me last night. I need help from someone who knows about the spirit world. Me and my wife moved into the third floor of an old jail that has now turned into an apartment. We've lived there 10 months. I've never experienced anything paranormal in my life and didn't believe in stuff like that. For the past month I've been waking up on random nights to the sound of someone opening our apartment door and stomping through. Every time it happens I pull my flashlight out, grab a weapon and clear the house only to find nothing. Two nights ago I had got done clearing and I was putting my weapon away while leaving my flashlight on the bed so I could see. All of a sudden our bedroom door was forced open and my light shut off immediately. I tried to pass this off but last night something let itself be known. I have developed extreme anxiety and panic attacks since moving to our apartment. Last night I was having a panic attack and started talking to my wife to get through it. Twenty minutes into our conversation the wall catches our attention. In pink writing, there are multiple phrases on the wall appearing that make no sense. One said, beg for me. Another said, cannot. Everything else was not legible. I removed a picture of us on the wall to make sure nothing else had been written and it had not. Immediately I called my mother because she is spiritually in touch and as soon as I did, my wife screams and says that under the picture I had removed and replaced that more letters started to appear. I began to feel very sick and cold. Out of nowhere I started crying on the phone with my mother and I am not an emotional guy. It felt like something was leeching my energy while on the phone with my mom. Whatever it was, it would not let me up. One of my wife's hand-colored pictures got tossed from an end table to the couch. This is all occurring live while on the phone with my mother. My mother immediately came over with a Bible. We started praying and we were thinking that things had finally come to an end but something started leeching my energy yet again. At this point I knew that I could not stay there last night so we are currently at my mother's. It's 5.30am and I've barely slept. I have classes in the morning at 7. I really need someone's advice and help. I really thought this kind of stuff only happened in horror movies, but it just happened to us. Let me start by saying that my kid is completely normal, loud and energetic and playful, not quiet or to herself, but she has had her fair share of creepy moments as I'm sure all kids do, but one incident stands out most of all. She was about four years old when her, my boyfriend and I were driving down a dirt road outside the town we live in. There are two random graveyards off this road, not overly old or creepy though. We never paid much mind to them. However, this time, she was looking out the truck window and pointed towards the graveyard and said, Look at the kids! 
My boyfriend and I glanced at each other in the front seat, looked towards the graveyard. No one was there. There was never anyone there, as it's basically in the middle of nowhere. We swung the truck around and parked outside the fence so we had a good view of where she had pointed. We asked her, Do you still see the kids? She said yes. We asked her, How many kids are there? Three. We asked her, Are they happy or are they sad? They're sad. I started to tear up. I didn't feel scared, just heartbroken and maybe a little creeped out. She hasn't spoken about the kids in the graveyard since. So in 2011, I bought an old house in Connecticut. It was built in 1875. The house fits our needs as a family, but the basement is pretty much comically reminiscent of the scariest horror movie dungeon basement you can imagine. Old stone foundation, cobwebs, two single bulbs dangling with pole strings to activate them, barely illuminating the dark, foreboding basement. My wife refuses to go down there because of how creepy it is. Anyway, we would jokingly talk about our haunted horror basement, that kind of situation. I started to get a little more active in my basement, organizing things a little bit, and I built a workbench for my hobbies and hung a pair of fluorescent bulbs above my workspace so I could actually see. But the rest of the basement remained that kind of creepy, can't really make any details out in the shadows kind of lighting. The more time I spent doing things down there, the more I felt a little unnerved by how quiet it actually was. While alone down there, I could hear noises that didn't sound like regular house noises, and my dog stopped following me down there, just little unsettling things. Then one day my dog trotted up next to me like he never had a problem, so I went about my business. About five minutes later, he starts growling into the dark, stopped abruptly, looked confused, and then darted up the stairs. I took a flashlight and investigated. No animals hiding that I could see. So in order to calm my own nerves, I just decided to roll with it. So I started talking to the darkness. Not seance kind of communication talking or talking to myself, just kind of talking as if someone was there listening. I started making promises to the dark of my basement. I promise I'll keep up. The kids have been busy, but I won't forget. Or while working on a project, I would just talk about what I was doing a little bit to whatever may or may not have been there. Has anyone ever read the book Christine by Stephen King? In a nutshell, the better condition of the car, the better things worked out for the kid who drove it. Similarly, I started taking a little more proactive approach in my basement. I named my maybe ghost Nathaniel because it's a good historic Connecticut name and I call him Nate when I'm in the basement. As I started spending more time in my basement and cleaning it up some, some fun little positive anecdotal experiences have been happening. It kind of felt like something was there. Could have been my mind forcing me to think it. Could have been real. But I would say things in my basement like, Do me a favor. If you're there and want to reveal yourself to me, just don't do it in a spooky, creepy way. Don't just appear. Knock something off a shelf first or something so I'm not surprised and crap myself. I couldn't find a pair of work gloves one day, looked all around the basement. I said to Nate, Nate, can you give me a hand here? Half under my breath, and as soon as I said it, right where I had stepped a dozen times in my search was a pair of gloves I was looking for. The potential ghost, Nate, has now helped me find tools, keyed me in on some things I was supposed to remember, and something I was looking for literally fell off a shelf once. The ominous feeling of the basement has all but disappeared, and my dog is still a bit wary of the basement, but he comes down to hang out once in a while instead of standing at the top of the stairs and whining. As far as I'm concerned, Nate is an all-around good guy. I hope he appreciates the attention. My routine in my basement is now when I go downstairs, I say good morning or good evening to Nate, mutter about whatever I'm in the basement for depending on how long I'm down there, I just talk to nobody about what's on my mind. And, oddly enough, it's therapeutic. A recent experience has led me to believe in the reality of telepathy and supernatural connections between human minds and consciousness. I wanted to share my story because A, I feel the urge to and B, in case it can be of use to any current studies or theories. 
I, a 31-year-old male, was in a dark place on the night of June 24, 2017, the darkest in recent memory. Life events had driven me to wish I was dead and even to imagine various ways of ending my own life. Though I didn't actually intend to kill myself, I was giving serious thought to how much easier it would be to die rather than to go on living, which I think is normal to experience every once in a while. I eventually nutted up and overcame my problems, so I'm much happier now. Anyway, this went on into the twilight hours of the next morning before finally going to sleep. Upon waking, I called my mom to see if she was on her way to pick me up yet. I was at what was once my house but is now my ex-wife's and my car had recently been repossessed, both indeed being a few of the said problems. She confirmed that she was getting ready and almost out the door. She asked if I was okay, to which I said yes because I didn't really want to say otherwise and have a conversation about my issues at the time. She then said that she asked because she had a repetitive, nightmarish dream about me the night before and has been worried about me ever since. Being somewhat curious, I asked her what it was about, and what she said gave me chills. She saw me grieving at a funeral in front of an open casket. She came up behind me and saw that no one was in it. Still grieving, I climbed into the casket without noticing her and laid down. She sensed that pressure of life was driving me to do this, and so shook me and screamed, Snap out of it! Don't let it bury you! Whatever's burying you, you have to bury it! She said she had this dream over and over again during what I'm almost certain were the very moments of my aforementioned experience in the real world, roughly 50 miles from where she was sleeping. I didn't let on to how freaked out I had gradually become as she recounted the dream, and thus went on a web search for like phenomena. I came across dream telepathy, which is described by the wiki as the purported ability to communicate telepathically with another person while one is dreaming, and more fitting to the situation because I don't recall feeling her presence as a dream where we may have touched the consciousness of another person and have accurately revealed his or her thoughts, actions, or life situation. Although there's a chance that it might have been a coincidence because she was aware that I'd been having a rougher time than usual in life before having the dream, the timing of the dream and its abstract accuracy of what I was experiencing in real time leads me to believe that it wasn't. Thus, I learned that that day there's more to the capabilities of our mind and the connections between them than meets the eye. I'm happy to have shared this and hope it contributes to the paranormal conversation and is of use. My dad grew up in the 70s in a wooded area in Maine. It was a tiny neighborhood with woods surrounding the outer part. My dad had all sorts of unexplained activity in his mother's house, but this is the one that stuck with me. My dad was around 9 or 10. He couldn't sleep. Right outside his bedroom was a window, and he could easily look at it from his own bed. He heard noises outside and he got excited because he thought it was a moose or some wild animal, so he whipped open the shade. There was no moose. Looking back at my father was a little boy his own age, maybe a bit younger. He wasn't sure exactly what he was seeing, it was very foggy, but it was undeniable that he was looking at a little boy, a little redhead boy with overalls on and one of those stupid propeller hats. My dad wanted to close the shade and pretend he never saw him, but he just couldn't look away. The boy smiled and waved, he began to walk away, becoming harder for my dad to see. Eventually the boy disappeared into the fog. It was dark and there was the thick fog. It was easy for my dad to convince himself he imagined the whole thing. I think little kids find it easier to convince themselves nothing happened, they just have an overactive imagination. That's what adults always tell children anyways. My dad was over at a friend's house a few days later. They were outside, shooting BB guns, normal kids in the 70s freedom type playing. The friend's dad was working on a car. My dad tells his friend the story, thinking they would both laugh at how silly my dad was. My dad told the friend, and the friend's eyes widened, and he lost color in his face. The friend books it over to his dad. My dad panics a bit, thinking the friend was telling his dad that he was trying to scare him, and my dad would get into trouble. The boy tells his dad, 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 he saw the boy with the funny hat, too.
I was a teacher for many years. I worked at a school where many of the staff and students had experiences with the dead. The school was constructed on property sold to the church. The property was reclaimed cemetery ground. Since the cemetery was a pioneer era cemetery and some of the families of the dead could not be located to gain permission, not all of the graves were moved. Half of the cemetery is still located on the adjacent property. The city has taken over ownership and care of it. School parents do not know some of the dead are still there. My boss figured out that I knew. Well, one of the other nuns figured me out, so my boss asked me one Saturday when I was at school grading things what I could see and hear. The other nun realized that I could see a teen boy hanging out behind her in the library. So, her too. The incidents were so numerous, especially at night, that we couldn't keep a cleaning company. A Catholic nun who was psychic had been called in and gave our principal information about the spirits at the school. She shared it with me one Saturday. Following the visit, we had a little ceremony in the school hallway dedicating the school to the protection of the Virgin Mary. Our students and parents thought it was a nice tradition. The principal told me it was to try to decrease some of the activity and to send some of the children and restless spirits over. The school was quiet for a time. What she did with this was to send some of them out of the building onto the playground. A few crossed over, another story for another day. In addition, we had mass in the cemetery and all saints day for a few years to pray for the people in that cemetery and to give them peace. I could see the dead in the location of the graves. Out of respect, I would not walk over them. Imagine having a blacktop and a basketball court over your final resting place. Maybe you wouldn't be a fan. I would sit in the faculty room listening to the other teachers talk about hearing footsteps or voices and think, there's so much more. Children would ask us if the school was haunted. Our party line was to tell the children no. Why frighten them? But children knew. My children and I were all sensitives. One day I was sitting in my classroom grading spelling tests during lunch. I had the habit of turning off the lights to save energy. Since I live in California and the windows ran the length of my classroom, I had plenty of light. I looked across my desk and saw a little girl crawling under a row of desks from the back of the classroom to the front. I looked down towards my papers and watched her. She came out from under the desk in front near the chalkboard and stood up. She turned towards me and smiled. At first I thought one of my students was pranking me. I love a decent, non-harmful prank. Then I looked at her. Yes. I figured out she was dead. She was wearing a lightweight brown woolen dress and a beautiful shade of tobacco brown and a lace-up calf-sized boots. She had big brown eyes and light brown wavy hair that was not brushed properly. Her hair needed some attention. I became instantly upset that they had not brushed her hair when she died. She was very pretty but obviously wearing 1880s to 1920s attire. She was about 8 or 9 years old. I asked, are you playing hide and seek? Don't you want to go outside and play with the other children? She didn't answer me. Okay, I remarked. You can stay in here with me. You got me for a minute. She smiled and then faded away. I will call her Trudy. Even in death, I will protect her true identity. I would sense her around after that when the classroom was empty. When I changed classrooms, she went with me. She seemed happy to hang out. The students never reported seeing her. I knew she was buried in the remaining cemetery next door. One day after school, my son was waiting for me to come out of a meeting. I led him into my classroom and went down the hall. When I returned, the top of my desk was a mess and my son was standing against the furniture on the back wall of the classroom opposite from the desk. He was a little shaken. Mom, he said, someone doesn't want me in here. It's a little girl. She's jealous. We talked about what had happened. My son sat at my desk to do his homework. She threw the things on my desk towards my son. So, I stood there and told this child that my son was my son. He was my priority. He had permission to be there. She was welcome to be around me any time, but that is not our right to scare him or hurt him because I loved him. She was not allowed to hurt him. I told her that he was a nice boy and that he would have been her friend. I could feel the tension in the atmosphere subside. We decided to try to find her grave. My son wanted to bring her flowers, so after mass on All Saints Day, he and I wandered the length of the cemetery reading headstones. We found hers, 
and my son said, This is it. We told her it was okay to cross over. We told her it was our right to stay until she was ready to leave. We told her that the people who she loved were waiting for her on the other side. We did all of this without the other teachers or students knowing about it. It was our business, his, hers, and mine. We took flowers to her grave a few times, my son's idea. And one day, I will go back to look for her. I don't know whether or not she crossed over. I hope so. I didn't take her with me when I left the school. I don't know if she is still there. Now that my kids are grown and out of the house, I would like to go back and possibly try to help her. Several years ago in high school, I had this hippie teacher who was into New Age spiritualism, and she was very open about this to our class. On the last day of school, when we didn't have any work to do and were all just lounging around the classroom signing yearbooks and stuff, she struck up a conversation with a few of us about her spiritualism, she told us it was possible to transfer energy through your hands, and she showed us this one at a time. She stood a good distance away from me, maybe about 15 feet, and held out her hands, palms facing the ceiling towards me aligned with my hands, and I did the same back to her. I saw her do it with a few of the other students before me, but I didn't believe it. But to my surprise, when she did this, I felt a strong tingling sensation in my fingers, like something fluid was coursing through them. To this day, I still wonder if this was real, or something paranormal, or if she was playing a trick on us. Is anyone else familiar with this sort of thing? This is a true story that happened to my father about 13 years ago. That day my father was so excited to be taking a shop class at a community college. The catch was he had to travel over to a mountain to attend it. He asked to borrow my sister's car so he could attend the seminar for the weekend. He headed off early that winter morning for a fun full weekend. About 10 a.m. that morning, I got a call saying my father was being life-flighted to Utah Valley Regional Hospital. He was in critical condition and was rushed into surgery to fix a broken femur that was projecting out the side of his leg, collapsed lungs, and other major injuries. It was touch and go for four weeks while he was trying to heal. During this time, we had the car towed to the local impound yard. I went with my mother to clean out the car and meet the insurance adjuster. As we were cleaning out the car, I noticed the back window was completely shattered and the front driver's seatbelt appeared to be cut. It was as if someone had come along and cut the seatbelt about where the clavicle bone would meet the seatbelt. I double-checked to see if there were any frayed edges, but there were none. I know my sister at the time never kept a seatbelt cutter in the car, nor could I find any scissors in the car. The hospital told us the emergency crew had found my father laying in the snow, which had sent him into hyperthermia and had in the process saved his life from his severe internal and external injuries. It appeared that my father had a stroke. He either had the stroke which caused him to go off the cliff or he had fallen asleep at the wheel and the accident had caused the stroke. They said if he had not flown out the back window, his injuries would have been twice as bad and he would be dead on impact. We got a copy of the police report in the accident. The report states that a man had flagged down a passing car for help. The driver of the vehicle saw the man and saw tire tracks going over the edge of the cliff. We decided to stop and see what assistance he could help with. He followed this man and looked down the cliff to find my father laying in the snow all bloodied and injured. The car had been rolled and got stopped by a boulder 250 feet down. If it hadn't stopped him, he would have fallen another 250 feet down into the river. My father had flown out of the back window during the accident and had landed in the snow. The man who stopped to help tried to call for help, but his cell phone had no service. The man who flagged down the help offered to stay while he ran down the mountain to get help. When the emergency crew got there, he was still with my father and showed them where to find my father. They immediately attended to my father, then thinking this man was part of the accident, they went to find him to treat him as well, but he was nowhere to be found. They look all around and said the only footprints they could see was the ones the emergency personnel had made down the cliffside. They all gave a description of the man that was staying with my father in the report. The description was very odd to me. Months later, my father was finally able to come home with home health care. I decided to ask my father if he remembered the accident. He said he remembers most of it, 
but not his time in the hospital. I asked him if he had cut the seatbelt and with what. He said he never cut his seatbelt but had been flown out the back window during the accident. He said he tried to call for help but he had no service. He also said that his best friend and who was also an uncle a year older than him was with him through the entire accident but just before he went off the cliff until we saw emergency personnel. He sat with him comforting him as he went in and out of consciousness. The description of the police report also fit my great uncle's description. I remember growing up spending many days at his family's home during the summers. My father and uncle Farrell were very close. Farrell had passed away a year earlier from the time of my father's accident of brain cancer. My father was devastated when it happened. Not only did seeing him at the accident help him live, but it also helped my father heal from the loss of his best friend. We now believe Uncle Farrell is my father's guardian angel. Hey guys, if you enjoy these stories and have a story of your own, be sure to send them to letsreadsubmissions at gmail.com. And if you want to support the channel further, feel free to check out my Patreon where you can have early access to MP3s of all future narrations and many other awesome rewards. Thanks so much, and we'll see you again soon.